Don't worry. Yeah. Oh, true. Yes, when I said the yeah. <laughs> I didn't see the time stamp on that, but okay. No. <laughs> yeah, right, exactly. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, I, oh, you look like I'm. <clears throat> I always feel like I have less hair when I look at myself in these things than I think I do. <laughs> no. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Yeah, right. <laughs> What's that? Um, we are far away. Um, yeah, I don't know. I guess it's, there's no policy in town hall. Yeah. Uh, I've been, I know, I know. All right. Yeah, right. 
đấy So thank you all for your patience. I greatly appreciate it. Um, Dwayne, we have a quorum. The meeting is recording. So if you wanna get started. Great, thank you, Stephanie. Um, Dwayne Breger, um, hereby open the meeting of the Solar Bylaw Working Group for July 15th, 2022. Um, and uh, thank you all for being here. <laughs> I do want to acknowledge um, uh, again um, my my uh, pleasure in, in uh, being designated chair, and I'll do my best to uh, keep us on track uh, as we go through the year um, uh, and help drive us forward. But obviously, looking for everybody to contribute uh, to this effort, uh, both during the working group meetings as well as uh, in between the meetings, because uh, we do have a lot of work to do and a lot of perspectives and expertise in the uh, working group that we want to um, take advantage of and tap into. Uh, I do also want to acknowledge uh, Martha, uh, who has been designated vice chair. Uh, and I appreciate uh, that and, and uh, working together uh, as we go forward. Um, and, uh, and we can um, work a little bit more in terms of the, the role that the vice chair wants, wants to play. Um, let me ask uh, Stephanie, is it appropriate just to, um, I, I think people can see us, uh, but just to um, inform us as the working group, who we have remotely? We don't currently have any member remotely and they will show up when they do. Okay, on. okay, like a normal Zoom, they'll show up or if, or if they're public, then uh, they won't show up necessarily, but. They should show up as a presenter, but they're, okay. um, they're not, the public does not show up. Okay, um, so we do have a quorum, but we don't have any other um, uh, working group members remotely. So um, I guess the one thing I'll say is uh, my hearing is not the greatest. Um, so um, just let's try to speak up as much as possible, uh, particularly because there's a lot of echo, it seems like, in this room. Um, and um, use the microphones, I guess, even though we're talking basically between ourselves. Um, one of the first order of business um, is to have a minute taker. Um, taking minutes is a really important um, role and obligation for the working group and for any of these uh, committees. Um, and so what I'd like to uh, put forward is that we uh, do uh, take minutes on a rotating basis uh, amongst the working group members um, with the exception that I'd like to be exempt from that, uh, just so I can run, help to run the meeting without taking notes, uh, which I wouldn't do very well. <laughs> um, so does that sound okay to everybody? Um, and um, I think it might be easiest to uh, just go in alphabetical order um, and keep track of that. So if it, somebody's not here, they'll get caught up in the, in the, uh, in the next round. Um, and so uh, that books, uh, Robert, are, are you um, prepared or um, okay to take notes? I'm not prepared, but I'll do my best. Okay, I do, um, I do know that um, it's great to get a, it, it, consider it sort of a draft of the notes. And, and then uh, I think Stephanie also, and, and Chris maybe as well, but would help to, to put them in uh, a final form. Is, is there also like a transcript that could be made of this meeting or no, like a Zoom transcript? The Zoom transcripts aren't, we don't use them because they're terrible. They misinterpret a lot of what's said. And so we haven't, it automatically shows up. They're all, all, automatically on there when you look at the Zoom meeting recording, but we don't make the transcripts official because they're not accurate. Yeah, Chris. There is a video of the meeting though. And when I'm doing minutes for other groups, I find that helpful to watch the video. Okay. And so to take them, they can have a second go at it. Okay, great. So um, Robert, thank you for uh, doing that this time and just um, 
I guess next, next up would be Dan and we might inform him ahead of time um, for the next meeting. Uh, I could ask, especially right now, I don't know anybody's name. So okay. if you could just say who you are before you start speaking, thank you. Okay, good, yeah. Well, why don't we take the opportunity um, to quickly just introduce ourselves by name and then I have a little bit of a, uh, an um, agenda item to provide a little bit more um, uh, introduction to each of us in terms of our perspective and expertise uh, and so forth. But for now, let's just go around and make sure everybody knows each other. So I'm Dwayne Breger. Um, Bob Brooks. Janet McGowan. Christine Brestrup. Stephanie Chicarello. Great, so you might um, just uh, take notes of who's present and who, who's not present. Yeah. I just want to note that I, um, Bob, you can just get a draft to me. I, we do have the recording and I'll fill in any blanks. So don't be too worried. It's just a draft that we need. Great. Um, next, official, and it, um, I think everybody has the agenda, or at least it was uh, provided ahead of time uh, if needed. And as needed, we can maybe flash on the screen, but I don't think we need that right away. Uh, but the first, formal order of business um, is to review and vote on the minutes from the last meeting, June 22nd. Um, I'm not sure if people have had a chance to review those um, and ha or have any um, comments uh, or suggested changes to those minutes, or if they would like to have it put up on the screen to review quickly. I um, had a slight change. I think something that Martha said was attributed to me about the work of the working group, and I agreed with her. So that was the okay. only change I saw. What page is that? I think it's on page two, but I don't, that's calling my memory. We were discussing what the working group is going to do. I don't, can you pull that up, Stephanie? Maybe? Okay, thanks. So on page three, I think Martha had raised the question about um, the um, community outreach and um, values and then um, priority list. And then I had agreed with her and said it should be important to clarify who's making what decision. Okay, so are you- I guess that's an ad. A, uh, a specific amendment? Where, where I'm trying to- so in section six on page three, yep. um, she had raised, I mean, Martha, maybe you could speak too, but you had raised the question about who was gonna do the community outreach. Outreach. You said you thought that the, our group was gonna do community outreach, um, figure out community values and priority site selection. And then we had a discussion about that and I agreed with her and said it was important, you know, who okay, makes the decision. So would you? I don't see where we. What line are you changing, says, and what are you changing it uh, to? In the middle of six A, it says uh, Ms. McGowan expressed concern. Is that the? Uh, yeah. Item. How do you want it to read? I would say Ms. Hammer raised said that she thought that the working group would be doing doing community outreach, 
you know, deciding, learning the values and then priority places for solar. I agreed with that. Janet McGowan agreed with that and said that it was important that we know who decides what. All right, and I think that is a topic for discussion um, that, that, that's worthy of, obviously, a, 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 those are comments expressed uh, sort of at the, at the, uh, at the beginning, uh, but I think worthy of, of uh, more discussion by the working group. Um, and uh, in fact, that's something I had in mind for a future agenda item, so. So we can make a note and we'll correct those in the minutes. Yep, so remind me, Stephanie, does that amendment need a vote or um, we just vote? You haven't made an, a vote yet. So that's just uh, an amend, amendment. So if there are any other changes. Yep, okay, so um, are there any other desired uh, amendments or changes to the minutes? I would just ask that you write down what you wanted. I did not be able to capture what you were trying to say. Okay. Do you, maybe we should, I should send that into Stephanie. We can vote on it at the next meeting. Would that be easier? Um, I'm fine with the concept. I just didn't get your word. I'm not. Yeah, I mean, we need some, I guess we would need some specific words. If uh, you can, I mean, you did say what you, you stated what you wanted. The, yeah, to be replaced that. with, we are recording, so I can go back to the recording, and I'll just type in what you said. Yeah, that's a good idea. So you can just leave it sort of blank and refer to recording or something, okay. and then I'll I'll get it, I'll capture it. All right. So if there's no other um, comments on the minutes, do I hear a motion to accept the minutes as amended? Okay. Thank you. Is there a second? Second. Great. Okay. So. Uh, okay. We need a voice vote. Yep. Because, um, well, theoretically, we have a remote member, but um, McGowan? Yes. Gregor? Yes. Hanar? Uh, yes. D we're voting on the minutes. I just need a yes or no vote on the minutes. Yes. Brooks? Yes. Then the Minutes right. are approved. Yep, great. Thank you, Stephanie. And thank you, group. Um, the next agenda item, which we'll see where we can get to at this point, is to um, schedule additional working group minute, uh, working group meetings um, with, I guess, to some extent, some uncertainty as to whether they will be by Zoom or in person, uh, which makes it a little bit harder to, to uh, commit to people's, to your calendar right now, because um, at least in my case, there could be some days that I can certainly do a, a, Zoom, meet, a Zoom working group meeting, but not in person. Uh, but nonetheless, my sense is that um, it would be good to get on the books two meeting dates that at least the, the four of us can agree with, and hopefully the rest of the working group is okay. And I would suggest to try to meet two more times in the summer uh, before the end of August. Uh, and then we can uh, potentially readjust our calendar and our schedule for some recurring time once the uh, once this fall hits, and at least for some of us have school school and get onto a school and academic calendar. Yes, Stephanie. So the next two meeting dates, if you were to meet every two weeks, would be Friday, July 29th, and Friday, August 12th. Yes. Yeah, those were the two um, suggested dates. And how does that, yep, so it'd be, the idea would be to continue this meeting time on, on Fridays, noon to two, and the next every two weeks for the rest of the summer, which is basically two additional dates, July 29th and August 12th. Do people have, do people at least in the, in the room feel like those meeting times work? I, I can't do the 12th. 
can't do the talk by remotely or, or in person. I'm, or not, I'm, I'm not quite sure where I'll be. Like, I'm not sure if I'll be hiking or okay. in a hotel, but it'll be away. Yes, OK, OK. Uh, all right, how about the, uh, the July 29th? Does that work? Maybe we should just get that one on the books for now. Yeah. OK, because I know. Uh, let's get that one on the books for now, uh, and we'll, we'll uh, plan to schedule that. Um, and, and, and think about when we talk about the agenda for next time, think about um, that time frame. Yeah, and you may potentially have a quorum for the 12th. You might not have Janet, but you might still have a quorum. Oh, that's, yeah, yeah. So that's you, uh, if you just schedule the next meeting, if, if the quorum here can meet on the 29th, okay. as long as you have a quorum, we're yeah. good. And then we can go from there for the okay. next meeting. And, yeah, so let's put both of those on the books. Um, do, do know, we like today, we recognize that, especially in the summer, but probably throughout the year, everybody is not going to be able to make every meeting. Um, uh, but we'll certainly need a quorum, and we'll try to uh, make sure that it's uh, uh, conflicting with as, as few people as possible. Okay. So we have that taken care of. Um, next, I thought it would be helpful uh certainly to me uh and, and hopefully to the to the every others on the working group um i think without exception i've only met everybody here um on the working group for the first time on zoom a few weeks ago we had some icebreaker and introductions um uh, but uh that was a little bit more about uh fun facts about us i think it was uh, as opposed to uh, sort of where we're um where where we where we are uh, in terms of our the level of knowledge, expertise, what we bring to this um, working group, and what we what uh, skill sets we don't have uh, coming into this working group. So I thought it would be helpful to go around, uh, and maybe we'll ask the others uh, to do so at the next meeting uh, to introduce yourselves a little bit more with regard to um, what your what what your uh, what you view your, your position is on this working group in terms of uh, um, particularly for those that are representing uh, their town committees, um, and sort of that relationship between uh, the committee and the uh, working group, uh, but then also, you know, what are your um, expertise and, and deficiencies, if you will, um, in dealing with the task, the task in front of us. Um, so I will start. Um, and so, um, I, I'm here representing um, uh, representing ECAC, the Energy, Cli Energy and Cli Climate Action Committee. Uh, and so um, that committee, and I, I will be the liaison with that committee as well. Oh, good, Dan, joining us. And um, I come at this um, working in the renewable energy field uh, since I was out of college, which means about 40 years or so. Um, and particularly um, in the areas of policy uh, and uh, I would say uh, economics. Uh, my background is, is uh, some engineering and policy, uh, but also resource economics. So what I recognize about the issues in front of us is that they're complicated. <laughs> there, there's no black and white answers. It's really an issue of, of uh, calculated uh, analysis, using analysis and well-informed decision-making about trade-offs that are in front of us and how do we as a social group, um, the working group, as well as the broader community, um, understand, uh, under, do enough, we bring enough analysis and information so that informed decision-making and, and uh, perspectives uh, can be voiced by the community uh, and that uh, policymakers and decision makers at the town level can make um, difficult but well-informed decisions. Um, and so I have no um, uh, issues <laughs> here with regard to, well, let me say that, that my, hot, my um, professional priority and, and, and focus has always been um, on addressing the, the climate emergency that we face uh, and the role that renewable energy 
um, plays centrally to that. Uh, so my main focus is trying to um, solve the climate crisis uh, and how the town can participate in that as well as the, the Commonwealth as a whole. Uh, and so that's sort of my focus. In terms of my deficiencies, um, I would say, I'm, I'm, as I mentioned before, I'm not an expert on zoning. Um, I really appreciated looking at uh, Chris's uh, 101 and look forward to hearing, hearing that because that was really helpful as well as the model bylaws, uh, but that's all kind of new to me. Uh, I will also say that I'm fairly artic uh, familiar or, or aware of, but not knowledgeable about issues with regard to um, uh, land use, uh, conservation restrictions and, and policies regarding land use, uh, particularly with regard to uh, forestry, farms, conservation land, and so forth. So that's, that's a bit of a, uh, of, of a deficit um, on, on my end. Okay, anybody? Anybody want to go second? Maybe my coach, my, my vice chair. <laughs> okay, so I'm Martha Hanner, and I'm an astronomer and planetary scientist, which means I've been very excited by the Webb telescope yeah. pictures <laughs> this week, <laughs> seeing back into the universe. Uh, but as a planetary scientist, then I've been also following the, the, the climate research and the, the modeling for decades now. And it's been interesting to me to see that as we've started to model other planets' atmospheres with very different initial conditions and so on, that helps give us confidence in the modeling for our own Earth's atmosphere. And I've watched that get more complex and so on over the, over the years. And to me, the most sobering aspect right now is that recent climate models for Earth predict that even if we were to wave a magic wand and uh, eliminate all uh, fossil fuel use <laughs> tomorrow, uh, it's th that in itself would not do the trick that we actually need to increase the amount of drawdown of carbon dioxide from the atmosphere as well. And that the overall goal isn't just quote, renewable energy, the overall goal is to mitigate the amount of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere. And so we need to consider all aspects of that, although we're concentrating on, on solar energy, certainly in, in this working group, we, we need to do it in the overall larger context and, and consider also the, the, the CO2 mitigation as well. Mm -hmm. And so, yeah. You know, I don't know that much about the town's zoning laws in the past and so on. And uh, I'm trying to read as much as I can. And we also have to read all about this, the latest uh, state regulations and the rebates and so on. So I'm uh, eager to learn a lot and again, help balance uh, these various complex considerations. So thank you. Yeah, Bob. Yeah, so um, Brooks, I'm Bob Brooks, and I've been thinking about this to inform my perspective. I know really one thing about solar is not involved in doing solar farms and animals like that. I don't know. I can do a little about that. And so that's a bit about zoning. However, as forestry, I grew up in the Adirondack on a working farm. It was a rural forestry based um, region. I went to school at three degrees in forestry and wildlife, 40 years as a wildlife scientist. And I worked for the National Forest Service, did all my field work on the Slavin. I'm definitely um, a believer in a working forest, conservation, wild use of forest. I'm not opposed to putting solar farms in forestry, on forest land. I think that probably I have more concerns about agricultural land in Amherst than about the use of forest land. And I'm, Quite interested in um, this whole process. I'm a little uh, overwhelmed, I think, <laughs> but I hopefully I'll be able to get back into sitting here and participate. It's really helpful. Thank you. All right, Janet. Um, so I um, am an attorney and a mediator. I practiced law for about 10 or more years doing mostly litigation. Um, I did a stint at the Conservation Law Foundation and Cultural Survival. I'm very interested in, I love the science 
of the environment. And I love using that in informing, you know, legal decisions. So um, I'm, you know, at Cultural Survival, it really focuses on indigenous people and making decisions about their land, which are often better, but not always than um, the policymakers do or the corporations do. Um, so that this part of the committee that is about working with our community, you know, collecting information and figuring out values, values is really important to me, partly because you need the support of the community in what we decide or recommend to the town council. I love research and analysis. I don't love reading law line by line, but that's what I do. And then I understand the importance of a sentence and a word. And so, and I also know that we need to have a lot of people looking at um, those things, you know, the bylaw to make sure it's good because you need a lot of heads and ideas. Um, alternative energy is kind of my family business. My husband's been working um, on hybrid electrification of municipal buses and now electrification of commercial things. So I know, I don't, I don't know a lot about batteries, but I know that they're hard to deal with things and there's a lot of issues about that. Um, my, I think my weaknesses are sort of the economics um, and you know the different the changes in the incentives and rebates, and you know I'd be interested in what other communities do to create incentives that we might make as recommendations. Thank you. Yeah, that's great. All right, great. We have. I, I'm impressed with the um, the knowledge as well as the diversity of the knowledge, which is fantastic. I am. I do wonder whether Dan. If, if you're able to hear us and, and, and speak, whether we're doing uh, sort of in, a little bit broader introductions of, uh, of who we are and what our strengths and weaknesses are as, as we uh, approach the year in front of us. And, and welcome, thank you. Yes, yeah, so I'm sorry, I had some technical difficulties, but I'm glad I was able to make it. <laughs> um, so I'm, I'm Daniel Corcoran, um, go by Dan. Um, I have 10 years of experience in environmental consulting where I primarily investigated and remediated contaminated groundwater and surface water. Um, I'm currently a researcher at University of Massachusetts Amherst. Um, I am uh, investigating the potential future impacts of lithium mining on water resources in South America. So what I can really um, bring to this group is an understanding of the potential impacts of land use changes on water quality. Um, I, I suppose um, my weaknesses would be that I, I have uh, no experience uh, working in town government or um, uh, with zoning. Um, so that, that's all going to be uh, a new experience for me. Great, thank you, Dan. Okay, thank you for that. Um, that really helps me, and, and I, I, I hope all, all of us to, to better know who who uh, who we all all are. Um, any thoughts before we proceed forward on that? Awesome. Okay, great. Um, staff updates. Um, that would be uh, you, Stephanie, and Chris. Sure, I have a, a few quick ones just in terms of getting our website together. Uh, we do have a website for the Solar Bylaw Working Group. There is a resource folder, so any resources that are sent by um, any of you or members of the public the documents go into that resources folder. So you get them in your packets, but I try to also put relevant documents in the resources folder. Not every single item or opinion or guidance will go into the resources folder. So you will get them always in your packets. So for instance, if someone sends an email about their opinion, that will go into your packet for your meeting, but it won't necessarily go into the resources folder. That is specifically for documents that are guidance documents. Great. Um, and as far as other updates, um, we are uh, moving along on the um, RFP for the solar assessment. So the town is working on that and our procurement person is away next week, but um, we are finalizing that and we'll be getting it out next week as soon as she returns. 
Thank you. And I, I, I have checked out the resource folder um, and it's really helpful. So appreciate, appreciate that. Okay, um, Chris, anything on your end? I, you're up next for the uh, 101, but- any... I, I don't have any updates. Okay, great. All right, any questions for Stephanie or Chris in terms of staff issues? Okay, so we're here to, to uh, uh, create and recommend uh, with, with, with help, uh, resource help from some consultants later on, and we'll get to that later. Uh, a, 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 sol a, a solar zoning bylaw. And so I thought it'd be helpful uh, as it sounds like others are in the same boat as I am that um, while we have expertise in various uh, areas, uh, we don't all have expertise in the actual understanding of and process in developing by um, zoning, uh, zoning bylaws particularly. So um, I really appreciate uh, Chris, your willingness to put together the uh, zoning uh, 101 um, presentation for us. I, I took a, a look, a, a, a scroll through it, and I think it has um, a great deal of value to this group. So um, appreciate you putting that together. And do you want to um, walk us through that? Hold on one. I'm sorry, you'll have to wait one moment because yep. I'm having a little bit of technical difficulty. It's yep. very confusing because my controls are actually up on the walls okay. and not in front of me and it's got me really disoriented so please just bear with me a moment while I try to figure no, this out no I, I have I have called IT for help so just bear with me okay. one moment I'm also going to say that I will take my mask off during the time that I'm presenting because my glasses don't work <laughs> if I have my mask on The irony is that on Zoom we get to to see more of each other <laughs> to some extent than uh, than in person. Hello everyone, I'm Chris Brestrup. I'm the planning director for the town of Amherst. And I've been um, working with zoning, I'm gonna say for decades, like, <laughs> I don't know, maybe even 50 years, but that makes me seem really old, but I think I have been working with it that long. Um, so zoning seems really boring, but it's really important. Excuse me, and, Chris, is it possible for you to talk a little louder? Sure. If I move the microphone yeah, closer, does that help? Yeah, yeah. Okay. All right. So here we go. Zoning 101, as Martha introduced it last time we were here together. So um, can may I have the next slide, please? So what is zoning? Zoning is the way a community regulates its use of land. And zoning regulations allow a community to control where different uses occur and under what circumstances. And I think um, Janet's going to be really helpful here too, because we went through a, a zoning blizzard last, last year. I think we adopted seven zoning amendments. The planning board worked on that, and it was really quite amazing. Um, so the authority, may I have the next slide? The authority for zoning comes from Chapter 40A of the Massachusetts General Laws. And zoning is also limited by state and federal laws governing property rights. So zoning may not violate the Constitution's takings clause, and that requires compensation where property is taken for public purposes. Um, and this occurs, um, sometimes the town needs to take property. It needs to take property along roadways that are being widened. And sometimes um, regulatory um, mechanisms are considered to be takings. So a taking can be either a physical taking or a regulatory taking. 
Um, but zoning can't take away the do dollar value of a piece of land from a landowner. So every piece of land in town needs to be allowed to be used in some manner. Um, next slide, please. So in terms of principal uses and getting down to um, what we're gonna be talking about, which is solar arrays, um, zoning must provide that at least some uses are allowed on each piece of land, which is what I just said. Um, and zoning must include all possible uses. So if a use comes into town that we've never heard of before, the building commissioner has to look at the table of zoning bylaws and figure out where does this go. So if you look at our zoning bylaw, it's got a pretty broad range of uses, including I think even something about radioactivity. But um, you know, I think we say no on that one all across the board. But anyway, um, so the zoning, uh, if a use isn't listed in the zoning chart, the building commissioner has to figure out a place to put it in. And currently um, solar, by, solar installations are not listed in the use chart. Um, but to date, large scale solar arrays in Amherst have been regulated under section 3.340, which is utility uses. And the subsection is 3.340.0, transformer station or other energy facility or use. And the zoning bylaw is available on the town website. There are a couple of different ways to find it. So the whole bylaw is there and you can find these sections um, online. Um, so, uh, in general, um, solar arrays are allowed by special permit in most zoning districts, and that would be a special permit from the Zoning Board of Appeals, or they're allowed by site plan review in the commercial and limited industry zoning districts. Um, and just to clarify this, we're talking about large scale um, solar arrays. We're not talking about the kind of um, solar panels that people put on their homes or uh, on buildings, um, that those things do not have to go through the land use permitting process. Um, may I have the next slide, please? The, um, we also have, in addition to principal uses, we have accessory uses. So sometimes large scale solar arrays are permitted as accessory uses. And those would be under section, under article five, which is called accessory uses of the zoning bylaw. Um, so for instance, the large scale solar array that's down on West Pomeroy Lane, it's right across from Applewood and it's part of the Hampshire College um, campus. That was permitted by site plan review by the planning board because it was considered to be an accessory use to the Hampshire College campus operations and it provides energy for uh, Hampshire College and not in general for um, you know, the area at large. Next slide, please. So um, in terms of why we need a solar bylaw, um, we already have a lar large scale solar installations that have been approved by the Zoning Board of Appeals or the Planning Board. And to date, <clears throat> four of them have been constructed. And these are um, on the transfer station on Route 9. I think you're uh, most familiar with that. That was just finished, and I'm not sure if it's online yet, but Stephanie would be aware of that, of the status. Then we have the Hampshire College array on West Pomeroy Lane. We have um, a private development on Pulpit Hill Road in North Amherst, and another one on Montague Road. Um, there's another installation that's been approved at the Hickory Ridge Golf Course, which is a piece of property in South Amherst that the town just acquired. Um, and that has not yet been constructed, but it has been permitted by, this, uh, by the Zoning Board of Appeals. Um, but even though you know, we have these solar arrays here in town, residents of Amherst um, have been concerned about problems of large scale solar arrays that have been built in other towns. And some of these problems include um, bad problems with erosion. Um, so they really would like us to come up with our own specific solar bylaw. Um, they've requested that the town develop a solar bylaw to regulate large scale solar installations so that they're constructed safely and in a manner that will be environmentally sound. So that's the process that we're currently engaged in. Next slide, please. Um, so the history of zoning in Amherst, um, or the history of zoning in general, is that it goes back to the late 1700s when President George Washington issued an order that there was a certain part of Washington, D.C., 
where um, all construction needed to be out of brick. And my guess is that has something to do with fire, that he wanted to avoid problems with fire, but I'm not sure about that. Um, the first official comprehensive zoning ordinance in the United States was in New York City in 1916, and it was a response to overcrowding and lack of sunlight and other unhealthful conditions where you had people living right uh, alongside industrial um, processes and the buildings were really close together, et cetera. Then in 1926, the Supreme Court looked at zoning in the case of Euclid versus Ambler Realty in Ohio, and the Supreme Court um, ruled that zoning did not violate the due process clause of the federal constitution. And then by 1940, zoning had become a, a common means of regulating land use in the US. Next slide, please. Um, so the town of Amherst has had its own zoning bylaw and zoning map since 1925. And it's been amended over the years by the town council uh, excuse me, by town meeting and then town council since 2018. Did I say that right? Yes, I did. Um, the planning department has copies of zoning bylaws that date back to at least 1937, and we have some of the old maps too. But I think that the town clerk has a more um, complete set of zoning bylaws um, than their electronic copies, and you can uh, get those from the town clerk if you're interested. Um, next slide, please. So in general, why do we need zoning? Well, I've talked about that a little bit already, but zoning allows the town to group uses according to their compatibility so that you don't have factories next to places where people are living. Um, zoning also allows the town to separate uses in ways that protect the health, safety, and general well-being of the community. Um, zoning enables the town to separate such things as industrial uses from residential uses. I just said that. And it has to um, have the benefit of health, safety, and general welfare for the community. So the first, um, the, really the first paragraph of the zoning bylaw states that the zoning bylaw is enacted pursuant to and under the authority of Chapter 40A, the general laws as amended for the purpose of promoting the health, safety, convenience and general welfare of the inhabitants of the town of Amherst and to encourage the most appropriate use of land throughout Amherst. So we'll be thinking about this a lot um, during our process of developing a solar bylaw. This zoning bylaw is in accordance with the recommendations of the master plan adopted in accordance with the Amherst Home Rule Charter and is consistent with the comprehensive plan of the regional planning agency. Um, so the next, uh, next slide is um, who creates and amends the zoning bylaw? Well, right now we have the town council that creates and amends the zoning bylaw, but the planning board has a huge role in that too. Um, the planning board and town council, usually in the form of the community resources committee, are required to hold a public hearing on proposed zoning amendments and to make a report to town council. So when we get to the point of having um, a, a, a solar bylaw that we're comfortable with, we would send it to um, the town council and then they would refer it back to the planning board and the community resources committee for a public hearing. Um, a zoning amendment requires a two thirds vote of town council members in order to be adopted. And that means nine out of 13 of the council members have to say yes to a zoning amendment for it to be adopted. And by the way, we get um, a review by our town, our other town council, C-O-U-N-S-E-L, our town attorney, um, whenever we have a zoning bylaw that's being proposed, they review it and make sure that it complies with um, the state law, as well as other town laws, and um, you know, make sure that it's prop in proper form to present to town council. So the zoning bylaw actually has two components. And one is the text of the zoning bylaw, which is available at this um, link here. Um, and it is, I think it's about 130 pages of text. It's kind of dense, but if you read it a few times, you sort of get the feeling that you understand it for the most part. I have to keep referring back to it because I can't memorize it, but it's, um, it's a very useful document. And then the other part of the zoning bylaw, next slide, please, is the zoning map. And I've taken a little chunk out of the zoning map. The official zoning map is the 
um, is the online electronic version of our zoning map. And it shows all the properties in town and what zone they are, um, what zoning district they belong to. And here in this image, you can see the area that's outlined in the yellow line is the town hall where we currently are. And it shows that the town hall is in the general business or BG zoning district. And the yellow areas around that, RG, are general residents. And there's a kind of striped area over to the left or the west, and that's the limited business district. So um, you should take a look at the official zoning map on the, on the town website. It's, it's kind of revealing. Um, and next slide, please. So how does zoning work? So the zoning map divides the town into districts and assigns each district a name. And I've listed a few of them here, but there are many more. Um, one of them is commercial. Uh, one of them is general business. And there's another one called neighborhood residential. But as I said, there are, there are many more. Every piece of land is assigned to a district. And the district boundaries sometimes cut through a piece of land. So you might have your frontage in one zoning district and the back part of your property in another zoning district. Next slide, please. Um, the zoning bylaw includes a table of uses. I tried to capture that here, but I wasn't able to, and I'm sorry about that, but you can go and look at the zoning bylaw and see the table of uses. Um, and again, it's many, many different uses. I would guess to be tens of uses, if not a hundred uses, but anyway, um, across the top of the chart, it shows the zoning district designation and then down the, um, Left side, it will show what the use is, and then the boxes are filled in with how are these uses permitted. And some uses are allowed by right, like agriculture is allowed by right. You can do farming anywhere, and um, you don't have to get permission for that. Some uses are allowed by site plan review, and that's a review that the planning board um, conducts. And um, with site plan review, the use is allowed, but this, the planning board can tell the applicant how to do the use. In other words, you know, how far back from the road, what kind of lighting, um, what kind of landscaping, et cetera. But they can't really, in general, they don't deny the use because the use is considered to be allowed if the applicant gives the planning board all the information it needs and abides by the regulations. The next category is special permit. And both the Zoning Board of Appeals and the Planning Board grant special permits. And the special permit is a discretionary permit. And so the, um, the body that is the permitting body can say no to a special permit. Um, and then the last category is N, which is not permitted. Um, so if you take a look at the use table, you'll see those designations. Next slide, please. Um, so the other part of how zoning works is that there are dimensional requirements. Um, and I did manage to capture that table here, but um, all the different uh, zoning districts have specific requirements for um, setbacks from roads and setbacks from side, from the side and rear of the property and how much of the land can be covered with a building or with other material. And in the case of a building, it would be, um, uh, how, how high can it be in various zoning districts? So that dimensional table gives you all of that information. Next slide, please. Another thing that uh, is contained in the zoning bylaw is overlay districts. And um, we have overlay districts for certain uses or limitations that we want to impose on certain parts of town. So for instance, WP is the Watership Protection District, and that is a district that is located up in North Amherst and it is adjacent to the Atkins Reservoir. Um, then we have the ARP or Aquifer Recharge District that is a large area that is, includes Lawrence Swamp in South Amherst, but also large areas along Southeast Street and other parts of South Amherst. We have Farmland Conservation District, which is um, in general covers areas that are um, in outlying areas, and generally it's the residential low density district that has the farmland conservation overlay, and it um, tries to preserve farmland to the best, of, uh, to the best it can and, and not to have sprawling developments there. 
PURD is another overlay district, and that's a planned unit residential district, and parts of Echo Hill um, are uh, in a PURD, and it, what it means is you can develop the land in a more dense fashion than you would normally be able to develop it. We have R&D, uh, Research and Development. That's along um, University Drive, along the west side of University Drive, and certain uses and, um, and activities are allowed there that aren't allowed in other parts of town. They're related to research and development of products. And then we have the Municipal Parking District, and that's... Um, an area in the downtown area where um, on-site parking is not required for certain uses. And that's actually a pretty controversial district. So um, my comment here is that uh, one way of um, dealing with uh, the information that we're gonna get out of the um, site assessment process that we're going through is that site assessment is going to show us where appropriate places or inappropriate places would be for solar installations. And we may want to create an overlay district that actually makes that part of the zoning bylaw to show where we intend to allow uh, solar arrays and where we don't want to allow solar arrays. So that's something to consider. Can, can I ask a question on that? Just because um, I'm trying to wrap my head around the um, the the overlay district versus the um what were the other districts called just no, more normal districts where everybody's in a district um and so if i'm a property owner I'm, i i always have a, a district associated with me but i may or may not have an i may or may not be in an overlay district great okay. that's correct yes yeah, so uh, an overlay district that was just established which got a lot of press was um on North Prospect Street, the area behind the CVS um, was recently designated as a parking facility overlay district to allow a potential parking garage to be built there. But the underlying zoning remains general residence. Okay. So it can't be used for anything else um, except housing. I mean, it could be used for anything that's allowed in RG, but it could also potentially be used as a parking facility. So, okay, so on these overlay districts, is there a similar table of like all the uses that could be used in an overlay district? Um, no, no, there's no table, but these districts are described, and I think it's in section three of the zoning bylaw, or maybe it's section two, it's section two, that's right, um, article two, but it gives a verbal description of these, and then okay. for certain ones of them, like aquifer recharge and farmland conservation, there are specific things that you can and can't do there. Okay. So. Okay, you should you. take a look at that, yep. Okay, the next slide, please. Um, let's see, yes. What does the state law say about, mass, uh, say about solar? So there are um, certain uses that are exempt from very strict regulations by uh, zoning. Um, we call them exempt uses. They're not completely exempt, but they um, are uses that the state wants to promote. They think these are good things and they don't want to restrict them too much. So among the exempt uses are educational uses, religious uses, agriculture, daycare, public service or public utilities, and solar installations. So there's a section of um, chapter 40A, section three, which states that no zone, zoning ordinance or bylaw shall prohibit or unreasonably regulate the installation of solar energy systems or the building of structures that facilitate the collection of solar energy, except where necessary to protect the public health, safety, or welfare. So that's something we should keep in the back of our minds as we're going through and creating a zoning bylaw related to solar. Um, so in general, it means that the town can regulate the dimensional aspects of solar, but um, we can't really prohibit its installation. We may be able to prohibit in certain locations, but um, not, uh, there can't be a blank prohibition. Um, so the next slide, please. So how does the planning board or ZBA, Zoning Board of Appeals, make decisions? And the planning board or the Zoning Board of Appeals receives an application for a particular use. And then the planning department staff, and there are five of us on the staff, um, and the building commissioner determine which use category the application falls within. And then they determine um, which district, zoning district, 
uh, the property is located in. And then that helps us to figure out which permit is required. Um, and then the Zoning Board of Appeals or the Planning Board holds a public hearing uh, after notifying property owners within 300 feet. And they also put a legal ad in the paper, uh, which is the Daily Hampshire Gazette, telling people when and where the public hearing will be held. And then people are allowed to come in and make comments. And then um, the Zoning Board of Appeals and the Planning Board receive a report from the Planning Department, spelling out the zoning issues that need to be considered and also telling the Planning Board and the Zoning Board of Appeals whether um, this particular proposal needed to be approved or reviewed by the Conservation Commission. And then we would tell the Planning Board or CBA, what did the Conservation Commission say about such a proposal? Next slide, please. Just a second, please. Can you just explain a zoning board and a planning board? I mean, there's two, two boards, but they have different functions? That's correct. Yeah, the Zoning Board of Appeals has a more narrow function there are only four or five things that they review. They review special permits. They review variances, which are very rare. They review appeals from decisions of the building commissioner. So if the building commissioner grants a building permit and people object to that, they can go to the Zoning Board of Appeals to appeal his decision. And then the other thing is they grant these things called comprehensive permits, which are a way that developers of um, housing um, particularly affordable housing, can um, get modifications of the zoning bylaw that aren't written into the zoning bylaw. So in other words, they could build something taller or bigger, or cover more lot area if they provide a certain percentage of the dwelling units as affordable. Um, so that's a comprehensive permit. So those are the four things that the Zoning Board of Appeals does. The Planning Board works on zoning bylaws, so they're going to be involved in developing the zoning bylaw along with you. They also work on the master plan, which they developed with a big group of people. They um, look at different things like, uh, we have this thing called chapter four, uh, 61, which is a tax um, category that allows people to avoid paying high taxes if they wanna use their property for farming or um, I don't know, forestry or recreation. And then the planning board has to, um, advise uh, advise whoever the legislative body is about whether these uh, places should can be released from um, their uh, designation as chapter 61 so and and they review scenic roads if trees are going to be cut along scenic roads the planning board reviews that so there are a number of things that the planning board does that are not all related to granting permits but the planning board also grants permits and they, uh, among the permits they grant is a site plan review approval. So does that help? Yeah, I was just reading that third bullet and trying to figure out, it says PB or ZBA and- Oh, so in certain areas, the planning board is allowed to grant site plan review approval for solar installations. And if you look at the use chart, you can figure that out. Um, but it's in very limited places. It's commercial district and limited industrial district. In every other place, it's the Zoning Board of Appeals that grants the special permit for um, a solar installation. So it's, it's normally going to be the Zoning Board of Appeals who reviews solar installations, but every once in a while, it'll be the planning board. Um, yes, yeah, so I think, yeah, okay. Oh, uh, so the planning board at the public hearing, they get this report from the planning department and they hear from the applicant, they hear a presentation from the applicant and they ask the applicant questions and they make comments and then they hear from the public. Um, and they keep doing that until they feel comfortable that they can make a decision. So they don't necessarily make the decision in one night. Next slide, please. Um, so after hearing from the public and deliberating, uh, they may decide whether they wanted to grant the approval or not, and what types of conditions would be necessary to make sure that the project can be successfully uh, constructed and operated. And you know, if you're interested, we have typical conditions that we've used for Zoning Board of Appeals special permits related to solar installations. Um, the Planning Board and the Zoning Board of Appeals refer to two sections of the zoning bylaw. They're like checklists of things that need to be considered 
One of them is 10.38, section 10.38. That's the um, list that's reviewed for special permits. And the uh, section 11.24 is the list that's reviewed for site plan review, but they are very similar um, in content really. Um, so then the planning board of the CBA makes the decision and they almost always put conditions on their decisions. So once in a while they don't, but most of the time they do. Um, and the special permit from the Zoning Board of Appeals can be appealed, and there's an appeal period that lasts 20 days. Um, so abutters or whoever is aggrieved can appeal the decision within 20 days. Um, the site plan review doesn't have a specific appeal period, but it is possible nonetheless to appeal a, a planning board site plan review approval. Next slide, please. Um, so you may ask, well, now that, you know, there's the decision that's been made and there are conditions that have been written, who's going to enforce it? And that is the inspection services, and they're under the control of the building commissioner. So he and his staff are responsible um, to ensure compliance with the zoning bylaw and any special permit conditions and site plan review conditions. And they read those before they grant a building permit for projects. Um, so they the building commissioner issues the building permit and after something is constructed, he would also issue a certificate of occupancy. That's not necessarily relevant to the solar uh, installation, but it's relevant to um, building projects. Um, but nonetheless, he is uh, on the site, not necessarily the building commissioner, but his inspectors visit the construction sites to make sure that what is uh, being built is in accordance with approved drawings and documents. And so I think that makes Amherst a little bit different from some other cities and towns. We have a very robust inspections team and they are you know, on the job when things are being constructed. And if anything is related to wetlands, we also have um, a wetlands administrator who goes to the site to make sure that things are being built in accordance with conservation Com commission conditions. Um, and then the building commissioner and his staff would also respond to complaints. So if the public saw something happening during construction that they thought was amiss or if they saw a problem, they could call our office and someone from our office would go out to the site and investigate and see if what is really happening is not uh, correct. Um, so that's really the end of my presentation, but I'd be happy to answer any questions if anyone has any questions. Um, you can get a copy of the zoning bylaw printed out for you by the town clerk's office. And um, it, it might be helpful like to look at the use table and the dimensional tables. I always put a little paper clip by them because they're kind of buried. So um, it's a long document, but it's, I think it's easier to have it in your hand than to look at it online. And I think it would be free for you, but I'm not 100% sure. <laughs> So if you do want a copy, we have copies in my office and you wouldn't have to pay for it. Um, so let us know if you want a copy. Okay. okay. Well, um, any other questions for Chris? Uh, so the your description of, of the quote building inspector and so on is a lot more than inspecting the construction of buildings, isn't it? When you, you say that it also involves like some of the environmental things or the drainage of a site or you know all, all of that kind of thing as well. Is that right? So the building commissioner and his staff would be involved in um, electrical connections, um, the, the structure of the solar arrays, you know, how they're installed, whether they're being installed properly. Other things like the environmental issues would be most likely um, in the bailiwick of the conservation department or the town engineer. So the town engineer gets a copy of a stormwater management report when an application comes through and he reviews the stormwater management report and sees if it complies with state law and local law. And um, then the building commissioner's uh, inspectors would make sure that whatever um, hard structures are used to create this stormwater uh, management system is built according to the way it should be built. 
So they have the drawings in front of them, you know, with the details and everything, and that's what they base their review on. You're not building that correctly. It's not, it's not the way it's shown on this plan. I found that really, really helpful, Kristen. So thank you. And, and also keep in mind that it's a document for our resources going forward, because I, I think I'd, I'd be referring to that as we go forward. Um, and uh, and the um, suggestion that you're, you're going to be working with us uh, on this uh, solar uh, bylaw is comforting as well. So thank you for that. Um, anything else on, on uh, zoning 101? <laughs> <laughs> we learned a lot for sure. Okay, uh, Dan, any, um, just speak up if you have any questions as well for Chris. Thanks, none for me. Good. <clears throat> okay, so let me um, then turn to the, um, I think we're doing fairly well on time um, to, um, the next agenda item, which is reviewing um, some model bylaws. Um, I guess I was comforted uh, to know, though I was aware they were out there, but I actually took the opportunity to, to look at them now, uh, that there are models for solar uh, zoning bylaws out there. Uh, so we're not starting from scratch. There's structures out there. Um, and um, I think the, uh, understanding these uh, in terms of their their uh, structures and what's in them uh, is going to be really helpful to us. And so we were afforded with three model bylaws. Uh, one is from the uh, uh, PVPC, the Pioneer Valley Planning Commission. Uh, that one I think we're going to put a bit on hold to review because Jack um, uh, was going to uh, provide a presentation or a review of the uh, of the PVPC model. Bylaw, I would say it's more than a model bylaw. It's actually a planning uh, toolkit that includes uh, zoning zoning issues. Uh, so I think that one's going to be very important for us. And I'd like Jack to do that. He seems to be more directly familiar with that work. Uh, so I'm going to ask Jack if he might be able to do that for us next meeting. Uh, but then we have uh, two others. Um, the Cape Cod Commission uh, has a model zoning bylaw, as well as a mapping tool. Uh, that I think maybe comes out of that model bylaw, but I'm not sure. Uh, and then DOER, the State uh, Department of Energy Resources, also has provided a model zoning bylaw. And uh, really appreciate Martha uh, volunteering to, uh, to give us a, um, her, her thoughts and review of those two uh, model bylaws. <laughs> Thank <Yeah>. you. <laughs> okay, so as uh, Dwayne said, at the present, we have these... Uh, three different models to give us food for thought and a basis for developing the bylaw. Uh, starting with the DOER model, uh, that was uh, published in 2014, which was before much of the, of the current large development uh, of very large solar arrays uh, came in, in Amherst. Uh, and so it, addresses some of the basics, I would call it the basic one that the others then can, can build and expand from. So first of all, we start with some definitions about the solar arrays and they're defined based on how, what their power is, uh, the uh, sort of the uh, minimum nameplate uh, rating capacity. <laughs> And that means if you have a solar array and you have the, the, the sun fully shining on it, um, how many kilowatts or megawatts of power does it produce? And so that's used often as a basic measurement. And on that basis, then uh, something that's rated 250 kilowatts in DC direct current would occupy about one acre. And so a one megawatt array would typically be four or five acres, just to give a, a general overall view here. So uh, 
using that then as kind of a, a basis, then if you're going to have a bylaw, you start out with the purpose, which in this case would be, uh, to quote them, to promote the creation of large ground mounted solar arrays with standards for placement design, construction, operation, monitoring, and eventual removal and so on. And so then the, the, the bylaw that we're going to create has to then very specifically uh, deal with these standards in, in the details and so on. And then the applicability uh, would, would be required just again, a general statement, similar to what you do for all the zoning laws. Uh, and then there would be a section of definitions, which would be important here. Again, this definition of what the rated nameplate capacity is and the power. And so the power is the instantaneous thing. And if you want to know about the energy, then you multiply by time uh, to get you know, the energy produced in an hour or a day or averaged over a year and so on. And also then uh, this rated capacity is in DC direct current and there has to be a conversion to the AC alternating current. That's what we use when we plug in our lamps or whatever devices, which then again, you have to uh, indicate efficiency. And if you have battery storage, then that's another case of efficiency. But that again, that's definition. And uh, so I won't go through all the various definitions of, of terms, but that would be an important section of, of this bylaw, since a lot of it is technical that we uh, planning board doesn't get to deal with when they're building a building. And so then, um, there would be a section of general requirements, you know, compliance with the laws and regulations and uh, uh, the permits and inspections and any fees and so on. And then the most important aspect really is uh, the specification, the site plan review. And that would be the section where you include all the details that you feel are important. And that would be what the planning board has to really rely on when they are reviewing uh, what the uh, what the gets submitted by the uh, potential developer and so on, uh, and so this DOER document uh, is dealing particularly with the case of what what's uh, Chris called the as of right areas. That would be case areas of of town where uh, it gets defined then that. Uh, the large scale arrays are permitted uh, with the, the, the specified restrictions that we'll get to. Whereas then other areas of town that are zoned differently uh, would require then the special permit that would, I guess, have to go then to the Zoning Board of Appeals. So that's the distinction there. Mm -hmm. And the DOER document deals mainly with requirements then for the as of right cases. So um, I think I won't go into any more about the DOER model because it's fairly general. And then the, the next two models that we have access, the Cape Cod Commission model bylaw and then the Pioneer Valley Planning uh, Commission uh, deal a lot more with some of the specifics now that are coming up with these large arrays and things. So. Uh, let me just close the one file call up the next one, wherever it went to. Uh, just take me a minute here. Okay, so then the Cape Cod uh, document that was uh, done a couple of years ago. And so it's it's somewhat more modern in the sense of of you know, responding to some of the experience of the larger uh, solar installations that, that have taken place in, in, in Massachusetts. And there have been at least, at least one or two big ones on Cape Cod that, that then, then it, this uh, active commission has been responding to. So it's uh, similar to the DEOER uh, model in the sense you have to state the purpose, you have to, uh, 
an applicability and then give the definitions of all the aspects that you feel are important and that have to be clearly understood in the specifications and so on uh, and that we'll be learning about over the next year. And then the Cape Cod model um, is actually extend, does a more extensive discussion of the safety and environmental standards section. Uh, for example, it uh, has a uh, discussion of the land clearing and, and how that is done, trying to minimize uh, the disturbance of the soil, for instance. So as much as possible, you can leave the soil's ability to be permeable, to let the water drain down and leave the roots and uh, topsoil and so on. Uh, uh, one interesting aspect was it stating insofar as possible, you would use uh, posts to uh, anchor your solar array as opposed to just paving the whole area with asphalt or cement and so on in order to preserve the uh, soil. I use those just as an example of the kind of detail that, that goes into that's really worth thinking when we get to the point of specifying requirements that you want to have requirements that don't prohibit the use in many cases, but specify very clearly uh, the details of how you protect as much as possible the drainage and so on. And then they have a section on uh, that I thought was interesting that if it's you're starting from undisturbed land, you should investigate the archeological resources, see if there's anything there. Uh, and then uh, they suggest that you could require a natural resources inventory. And here I'm thinking that, that the state has this bio, bio map that maybe is one thing we could later investigate and so on. And uh, then there's a section on stormwater management and a question then whether our town does have in, in, our, in our overall bylaws a section on, on stormwater management. Do we, Chris? Or, yeah. We do, it's yes. a general bylaw and it was just adopted, I think within the last year. Okay. Stephanie may know more about that because she's in the conservation department and they have been uh, working yeah. with DPW to develop this. Yeah, and so again, that would be something we could just compare with what already exists whether there was anything else we needed. Uh, let's see. And then they would suggest us having uh, specifics about hazardous waste and uh, uh, requiring that no hazardous waste be discharged on site. And then this comes into play specifically with the battery storage. Uh, batteries, uh, as Daniel would be able to tell us, would. Uh, contain in principle some hazardous materials and there would need to be specifications to make sure there's containment uh, so that there couldn't be any leakage and so on. Mm -hmm. Another interesting aspect in the Cape Cod model uh, is mitigation, uh, suggesting that if one was going to be uh, cutting down forest for uh, putting in a solar array, that one could require that an equal or even larger area of forest be set aside and permanently preserved. Uh, and that, again, if we are talking about, you know, uh, carbon sequestration and drawdown, that, that could be a, a possibility of uh, that. And then uh, that the planning board could, uh, could require, and again, this would be in the site plan, uh, uh, could require uh, very specific uh, construction monitoring uh, and, and, and so on, so that you know, there was regular monitoring of, of the extent to which the site was being, uh, you know, the, the actual site was being graded or different things or how much extra land was being cleared for access rows and that you could put in careful specifications as to how this is monitored. Uh, and, and they also suggest that, that once the site is up and running that you have uh, requirements for an annual maintenance report and ongoing monitoring. This could be particularly important with if we have, you know, severe uh, weather or, you know, terrific downpours and so on. And then there's a section eventually for 
removal that after a specified number of years, when the, if the site is no longer actively productive, they have very specifics for, the, for removal. And in their case, they, uh, of the Cape Cod case, they actually define discontinuation. In this case, if it's not being used to produce electricity for more than one year, or if it is operating at less than 25% of rated capacity, then they define that as being, okay, guys, it's time for removal. And so if we wanted to, we could put in some specifications like that. Uh, and there's requirements for the total removal, for recycling, for uh, site stabilization and restoration to what it was before, uh, if it was parted or somehow revegetated and so on. And in fact, they suggest in the Cape Cod model, specifically requiring a financial surety in advance, you know, concern supposing the owner gives up and says, gee, this is not profitable anymore and just sort of walks away from the site uh, and leaves it to the town. Is there some kind of financial uh, surety that, that the town doesn't have to spend uh, all their taxpayers' money for this reduction. And they actually include things like what happens if there's a transfer of ownership and also the process for appeal if the planning board makes a decision and so on, which I think is in our zoning laws and so on. Yeah, and, and so, yeah. Uh, so that was just the general overview. Uh, actually, the, the third document, the Pioneer Valley Planning Commission, is a lot more detailed in terms of providing some background for things that we should consider or, or discuss and so on. So I think that that is going to be a particularly uh, useful document, not so much in literally specifying the words in you, but in, 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 in giving the background and the things to think about and so on. Uh, so questions? Dan? Uh, yes, I was curious about the financial surety um, potential stipulation. Um, how, how do those usually work? Is this funding that's set aside prior to approving the permit? It, is it like a tax lien? Um, does anybody have uh, any understanding of how those work? Dwayne, Chris has her hand up. Yeah, please, yeah. Yeah, so to date, whenever we've approved uh, an installation of a solar um, array, there is a bond or some kind of surety that the building commissioner figures out with the um, applicant and the town engineer with regard to what the lifespan of the project would be. And then um, it's got a, uh, what do you call it? An accelerator, not an accelerator, that's not the right word. Um, what's the right word? Appreciation, yes, as time goes on, um, you know, cost of things gets higher. So um, that amount of money would be X amount times X amount of what it would be today. So we do have those in place now, and we would intend to have those in place in the future to remove the installation. Okay, so that's yes. basically an escalating amount of money <clears throat> that would be set aside that, that's, that's all on the backs of the, of the owner. Um, that they put, <clears throat> do they put in that lump sum at the beginning or is that something they sort of pay in over time? I would have to ask the building commissioner exactly how that works, but I can get that information for you for okay, next time. Details we'll get into, but um, so that at any point in time, it seems like there's money, would be money available through this mechanism if something goes awry with the, the project or the owner and they walk away and the town's left with this and it's not operating um, or the town wants to get rid of it, they have the money, the resources to do so. You know, I, as I've been reading about that, I keep on wondering, you know, when they talk about the lifetime of the array, I know the panels have a lifespan, but it seems to me that most people would just put fresh panels on. And I wonder, how do you figure out the cost of decommissioning an array? like? have people done that and you know and have they done it well too so it might be cheaper just to pull stuff out and put some grass down but i'm just wondering if we have some real life examples of decommissioning and costs 
question for us to consider. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. I, I was just going to say, in terms of the contract, where the we're working with a third party, and I'm thinking about the solar landfill project. Um, decommissioning is part of the power purchase agreement, so the responsibility is on the owner of the array to do so, um, and the cost of the decommissioning is on the applicant. It would be different, certainly, if the town owns its own system, then we'd have to determine that, but typically it's um, the decommissioning is on the owner of the array. And is, is there any language about the option of, of re, re, repowering or reinstalling? Uh, uh, not necessarily. The language isn't specific to being to reinstalling. It's typically to extend the terms of the contract. Okay. So, you know, it might be a 20 year contract with um, another 10 years of review that's reviewed every five years. So mm -hmm. every five years, there might be another option to extend. And at that point, um, after the 30 years, there is a lifespan. So either they would, you know, I, I don't think we've gotten there yet. So yeah. I couldn't speak yeah. to that. And I, I don't think, I'm not sure about the history of the world, but there's not that many projects of this magnitude that re have reached end of life to know the experience yet too much in terms of how that all plays out. But it seems like contractually, it needs to be <clears throat> part of this part of this bylaw. Yeah. And I think that that is an important question because solar panels are in, improving in their efficiency and so on. So it may be that even if the site still could produce electricity, uh, the the owners or managers may decide that it would be a, a good idea to replace the panels with with more modern ones. And again, I guess they, they would have to then submit an, another. Um, plan to be approved as to how they would do that. Yeah. And the whole subject of, of the batteries is another whole aspect. I didn't say much about it, but hopefully at some later point with our with Dan maybe for help, uh, we, we could discuss the whole subject of batteries and what kind of specifications uh, to put into uh, a bylaw. Uh, about the, the battery. Yeah. 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 yeah, yeah, good point. Keep, keep in mind these large installations <clears throat> are essentially required by the DOER to have storage connected with them. Um, and so battery, and hopefully we can draw from others experience as well. And some, I think these newer model bylaws are, are addressing battery as well, but it may be less certainty in that. Um, and less knowledge because battery technology is changing all the time and safety issues and uh, and the chemistry of them. Uh, and so, yeah, Dan, Dan sounds like he'd be a, a great resource um, on that. All right, um, Martha, that was great, by the way, really. I uh, thought that was a uh, really um, good review um, and touched on the, on the point. And I guess what, you know, just my general thought hearing Martha and, and looking at these bylaws, model bylaws myself, as well as the PVPC one, is that um, there is a roadmap ahead of us. We sort of know, we know that we, we, we unless we're gonna go completely rogue, we know the structure, we know the components, um, and there's a structure there. It's really a matter of putting on the um, flavor and, and, and uh, preferences and, and perspectives uh, that are, um, conducive with with town needs and town town desires, um, and uh, but but we're not we're not starting with a blank piece of paper, uh, and I took a lot of solace in that when I was looking at these bylaws, and, and also that as you mentioned, uh, while DOER was older, um, and even the P, the PVPC one and and the uh, uh, the Cape Cod they cover similar issues, um, so it, there is a there is a you know the things we can draw from that are pretty, uh, pretty. I'm not sure quite standard or conventional, but they're they're out there for us. I sort of have a point or a question for Chris. It seems to me that we're probably going to recommend, or we could recommend, a bylaw with very specific standards for medium or large scale arrays that are really like you have to do this, this, and this. And I don't. How much does it matter if it's site plan review? or special permit. I mean, I know, you know, one is section 10.38 and then 11 something or, something or other, 
but it just seems to me we're not going to do one huge bylaw for site plan review and a set of regulations for a special permit. Do you know, so I just wondered like what your thoughts on that are. So I think um, the things that Martha was reading and she was saying they were particular to site plan review. I think other towns use site plan review in a similar way that we use special permits. So I think that our bylaw would be created to apply to both site plan review and special permits. And we would just um, figure out which path this app installation needed to take based on the use chart. You know, is it in X district and therefore requires site plan review or is it in Y district and therefore requires special permit? So what Martha was talking about was really generic to both site plan review and special permit. So thank you, that's a good question. So when we, I, you know, we'll probably look at the zoning bylaw. So site plan review has requirements that, you know, for, that apply to all site plan review. And then special permit has more, more detailed and it's discretionary. So we should probably look at that separately. But I think in terms of these regulations, it seems we'd have to be basically saying for any large scale or medium scale, these are the requirements. So. Uh, yeah, Chris, thank you. I just wanted to point out that we also have been looking at a lot of other cities and towns in the area, well, really throughout Massachusetts and looking at what they um, are requiring. And some of them are you know, similar to Amherst and some are not similar to Amherst. So um, in fact, Janet brought to us, I think it was, it was yeah, Palmer. Palmer. Palmer had a lot of trouble with um, too many solar arrays coming into okay. town and they weren't being managed properly. So Janet did some research and talked to the planner there. And you know we kind of went through that bylaw step by step and talked about it in detail at one of our planning board meetings. So in the, I guess what I'm saying is that aside from these um, kind of model bylaws, we actually have bylaws that are in place in cities and towns that we can look at. And some of them may be appropriate. We can pick things out of other bylaws that may be appropriate to us. All right, great. And we should probably maybe in the, in the, these are all model bylaws. So um, uh, uh, they're, they're gonna be very helpful for us, but also helpful could be specific town bylaws that have been either drafted or passed. Uh, and those also can be helpful to us as well. Uh, to sort of look at the different flavors and and uh, priorities, I guess, given by, by different towns. Um, and so to the extent that we find those, maybe they can go in the resource folder as well uh, that we'll uh, be able to draw from. Okay. Any um, final comments on that before we talk about sort of the, the next um, agendas and, and, and so forth uh, before we adjourn at two o'clock. Great. Okay, so I really found this helpful as a as we called it a, a, a 101 um, uh, exercise to bring us all up to some base level of, of knowledge and information. And so I thought at the last meeting we discussed, uh, are there other topics um, uh, of, of um, introductory information, background information that we as a, as a working group should all be familiar with and on a somewhat common playing field and knowledge base to draw from as we sort of go forward together. Um, and so I'm, I, I have a couple ideas myself um, to suggest, and these would be uh, not necessarily um, similar to what Chris provided us of, of, a, of a presentation to sort of uh, provide a, a base knowledge. There's other things we can talk about separately, which would be specific discussion points of, of where we want to start honing in on specific discussions. But I'm thinking at this point, just as more as sort of a presentation, whether it's with PowerPoint or just a presentation uh, to bring us up to speed with some uh, uh, background information. Uh, and so, did you have, yeah, Martha, go ahead. Well, I've got to uh, Um, 
where what are the zoning districts, but then also, you know, what are the uh, the watershed uh, protection areas, you know, just see them on the map compared with the zoning or uh, the aquifer maps or uh, the natural resource maps, the conservation maps, but just to get an overall picture of our whole town and uh, what are the different zones and, you know, what kind of restrictions there are in a few of the zones. Uh, but just, it's easier to just see the whole map up on the screen and have somebody tell us about it than to try to uh, look through for ourselves. Yep, and I would, uh, that's actually very aligned with one of the topics I had had as well, which was basically an overview. Um, now we, we're all familiar with the town in terms of driving around, but as you say, uh, uh, Martha, to take sort of a bird's eye view of what, what, what we have here, um, uh, an over, and maybe it gets, it certainly gets into what um, Martha provided, but um, also maybe just looking at it from the perspective of an overview of the land use currently in, in Amherst, um, and, uh, and also any interesting or useful to us statistics on that land use, any current uh, patterns or trends that you're seeing uh, over the course of the last you know, decade and in, into, the, into the future. Um, and um, uh, yeah, and, and, and then how different pieces of land through zoning uh, either or state regulations are um, subject to conservation restrictions uh, or other rules and regulations, uh, just again at, at a pretty high level, just to get us all grounded um, uh, and more familiar with um, as we start thinking about these zoning zoning criteria, um, we have the language to talk about that. Do you think that either you or somebody from your staff or or maybe it's the conservation Commi commissioner, conservation group. I don't know. Um, Stephanie and I can put our heads together about that. Yep. Yeah, I think it might be a, something that maybe a few people will present. Maybe between Chris and I, we can figure that out. Okay, that'd be excellent. And you know, time permitting, if you had the time for the next meeting, or it could go to the next one if if, if you need more time. But that'd be great for um, the next meeting if if, if, if that works out. Um, as a word of warning, the, the map of the zoning districts and the overlay districts is really hard to see on a screen. And oh, so okay. the, the planning department has a big map, okay. um, which you know goes on a, a, a board. I have a good version of this that's probably almost as tall as me, oh, okay. um, which Chris made for me. I don't know if you remember, but I think it's almost impossible to get the overview on a small screen, so. Okay. Is that... Um... I will share my map with people. <laughs> is that something you could bring in? It, it rolls up in a piece of paper and you could we could look at that. Is that, that's permissible, right? In terms of public meeting to have something? To look at? Uh, I think um, we'd have to talk about that because if you gather as a body and there's more than a quorum of you present, we have to post the meeting. So- No, 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 at the meeting, at, at a meeting. Oh, at, right? but, we, but we don't know that we would be in person at the next meeting just- oh, so oh. if you were to do this outside of a meeting, I mean, and then maybe you could plan on the next meeting being in person, but if the governor signs the legislation, then when he signs it, it goes into effect right away. Okay, so. that's a good point. Okay, yeah. So even if we are remote, I think we can look at the map that Janet's talking at yeah. about and zoom in on yeah, various yeah. sections of it and you okay. get a feeling for that. But I also think that it would be useful to go through the official zoning map and help people to figure out how to look at it. Yeah. Because it is a little bit daunting when you first encounter it and you don't know which thing to click on or how to okay. move it around. And you know, maybe we could even give a demonstration of that. Yeah, that and that could be done on Zoom, right? Yes, that yeah, could yeah, be done right. on Zoom. Okay. Yeah, yeah that, mm -hmm. that would be excellent. Yeah. Okay, one one um, thought I had in terms of just a 101, which I would be happy to um, bring forward, is um, bringing everybody up to speed at, uh, uh, of what's going on with regard to state level um, uh, carbon mitigation, clean energy and carbon, carbon mitigation um, planning, uh, as well as their, the, uh, about a year and a half ago, they published a 2050 decarbonization roadmap of how statewide um, the uh, the different pathways towards essentially 100% renewables by 2050. 
uh, with intermediate goals and sort of through that analysis, which was a pretty rigorous analysis, including such things as land use um, of, of um, what the implications of that might be with regard to at, at not at the local level, but at a state level, what the expect, expectations are uh, or potentially needs are for solar development uh, in terms of gigawatts of, of capacity that would be needed to meet those meet those tar meet those um, commitments, um, and uh, and then also and and sort of connected with that, sort of zooming then down on the town level, being part of the ECAC Energy Climate Action Committee. Um, it would be also helpful for everybody to be up to speed on what the town's greenhouse gas reduction goals are as well, uh, which um, ECAC provided to the town, recommended to the town uh, early, early in our uh, tenure a year ago or so and ha has been approved. Um, and then also what's also maybe helpful that, that we've looked at in, at, the, uh, at ECAC is to the best of our ability of what is the what is the electric consumption in Amherst uh, and and what is that what does that imply in terms of uh, energy needs um, and what that might how might that inform us uh, in terms of um, uh, energy generation that we might want to um, provide ourselves uh, just to scale that all a bit. Uh, do, so I, do you mean the, the the CART plan, the climate action plan yeah, well, that you the, uh, for the town that did that you folks did? Yes. Yeah. Yes, yes, yes. Yeah. And there's some additional analysis that, that uh, I'm not sure if it's in the CARP or not, but uh, and it dates back to the 2017 or 18 or, or when was the last greenhouse gas inventory? In 2017. 2017 greenhouse gas inventory. Uh, there's some data in there that we've used to um, better understand electricity demand in throughout the town of Amherst and, and the campuses, um, and then some. Um, uh, and some projections based on the 2050 roadmap in terms of what does our electricity consumption look like as we begin to electrify our heating sector, our transportation sector, in aligned with what this, the state projections there, uh, and then what that all implies in terms of uh, um, uh, renewable energy generation needs if we were to think about. Um, uh, uh, and, and it's not necessarily that we have to, but just to scale it, what does it mean in terms of uh, solar capacity we might need to drive our own town, which is not necessarily what we want to do, but it just helps to scale that. So okay. if, that, if that sounds okay, I'd be happy to make a, a brief presentation to get everybody up to speed in terms of the state goals and what we know about Amherst at this point in terms of the energy side. Um, could we also add in the UMass and Amherst College what they're planning to do? Yes, because that, yeah, that's and, they're yeah. they're sort of half of our energy use, right? So yeah, yeah. It'd be nice to yeah. we have that broken. That out. could be really helpful. <laughs> yeah, yeah, absolutely. And and uh, uh, and as we look at the town, I think we have to sort of think. Um, I mean, e e the ECAC is looking at at that in terms of when we talk about our greenhouse gas emission goals. Does that refer to just the, the town outside of the campuses or does it include the campuses? Because each of the other campuses have their own plans going on. And, and um, uh, I, I'm not really, can't speak so much for the um, Amherst or, or Hampshire colleges, but I can um, talk about the UMass plan. Okay, so I'd be happy to do that if that sounds useful to folks. Okay. Um, And then we have, um, in addition, I'd like to start thinking about some discussion agenda items for um, the next meeting. Um, in, term, in terms of, you know, what, one thing I'm sort of interested in maybe might be helpful is, is uh, at this early stage of the, of the uh, effort, is it helpful, might it be helpful to us to, to plot out our work plan? Uh, you know, we, 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 it sounds like we have a long time, but what is it, may, may we need to be done, which, which is going to come pretty soon. Um, and uh, to some extent, I think it would be helpful to uh, get a bit of a roadmap together in terms of we need to cover these issues. We're going to have, I want to want to maybe have a discussion about the role of the um, uh, consultants 
that the town will be hiring uh, to support this effort. Uh, and maybe, I'm not sure if it's Stephanie or Chris could maybe help us with that in terms of just what, what we should expect with regard to the expertise and the role of that consultant. Uh, I think it's primarily to you know, do the nitty gritty of drafting uh, this language uh, and so forth. Uh, but I'd like to understand that and, 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 and incorporate that into our work plan in terms of when that would make sense and what we, what we uh, can expect or should be able to expect from them. Um, and um, um, yeah. Um, and there, there were some, some other documents that were sent around that might be useful to um, just have a discussion on with regard to some um, legal updates and cases with regard to solar siting, which were kind of new to me, but um, and I blocking on who sent them around, but there was this Tracer Lane um, Supreme Court decision. It was pertinent to our discussion, uh, as well as some land court rulings. Uh, who did, did one of you, I forget who put those, put those forward. Um, I guess one of the people not here. Laura oh, Peck Laura, 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 sent yeah, 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 exactly. some in. So she today. seems uh, very on, on top of those things. So uh, it might be helpful to ask her if she might be able to um, help us understand um, how we should, what, what the implications are of those um, and um, uh, give, give us a brief summary of those. That sounds good. But let me ask other, in terms of discussion items for next time. Uh, yeah, I would like to, uh, you, you mentioned about the, the, the consultants and so on. Uh, I would like to suggest that next time we, we review what is the charge to the consultants? What is their, their purview going to be? And Stephanie says, working on the RFP now so that they would see it. And also there was a question that had come up last time from, I guess from, uh, and was in the minutes about reviewing what's, what's our committee's role in regard to, you know, prioritizing the siting and, 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 and so on. Uh, yeah. yeah, I think there was a little question about that last time that came up. Right. Maybe we could discuss it. Yeah, and, and I think we, and maybe also just um, to um, articulate a little bit clear, more clearly um, the different consultants we're talking about. Is that what you're going to refer to? Uh, uh, just I want a point of clarification that there are two consultants. Yes. The one that I was referring to was for the solar assessment. That is not the consultant that will be working directly with this committee. They will report to this committee, but they're not working with this committee. There is a consultant that the planning department secured funding for to specifically work with development of this bylaw. And Chris can speak to that. The way we were envisioning this consultant who's going to work with us on the bylaw is to fill in information that we don't understand or that we don't know about. And I spoke with the building commissioner about this. So we asked for funding to have somebody who can help us to understand what's the role of battery storage and do we need to incorporate battery storage into our zoning bylaw or in fact, do we need a separate bylaw with related to battery storage? So there are things like that. I think that the planning department staff can draft you know, the basic language of the zoning bylaw, but you know, when, we, when it comes to areas that we don't have any expertise in, that's what we were hoping to get um, help from. I think if we ask a consultant to draft or to write the whole thing, it's going to be more expensive than the amount of money that we have available to us. So um, I can talk a little more in depth about that. At yeah, the okay, next great. Meeting. Yeah, why don't we maybe talk a little bit about that next time as well? Because um, uh, obviously, I don't think we have the wherewithal <laughs> to write the language. Um, uh, but but to inform the language and sort of say okay here's what we would come out with in terms of recommendation, uh, but to uh, you know that'd be great if, if staff or some combination of staff and a consultant can, can help us with that. Okay, but we can talk a little bit more next time then about the solar assessment, uh, which is which is going to happen much sooner. That's going to happen pretty soon. Whereas I think uh, what Chris is talking about is sort of on standby when when it's appropriate um, and when we need them. So, so I would like to t have us talk about our charge and act work plan, like, or I guess maybe, you know, roadmap, but it, it seems like we have, you know, the drafting 
we have a community process to work through. Um, and then the, you know, at looking at the solar assessment and figuring out like priority sites or non, you know, priority sites to save or to, to focus on. And so, you know, we, I, I, thinking it through, I was thinking we might want to break up into small groups, subgroups to work on those issues. But I think it'd be great to sit down and say, what do we have to do in the next nine months? You know, what's the, um, what activities that, what information we need or activities or what help do we need? And then when will it be done? And then knowing it will probably not work out that way, but at least we have starting with a plan. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah. You know, uh, very good. And I think, you know, one thing we can maybe specifically and uh, maybe not exhaustively, but but in, in, in some detail talk about this issue with um, uh, public engagement, I think came up uh, specifically and, and certainly, and to be clear on what um, the solar assessment um, RFQ is gonna be doing in that regard and our role uh, in this process as well. Um, so uh, maybe that should be a, a discussion, maybe a priorities discussion topic next week. Okay, uh, I don't like meetings to go over time and we're a little bit there. Um, and so um, I think the last, agenda item if if everybody's comfortable with uh, moving on um, is to see if there's any public comments um, we are short of time so we will take public comment and appreciate public comment uh, but try to limit uh, the time that we, we we have if anyone is interested in making a public comment please electronically raise your hand and we do have one member in the audience if you'd like to speak please also acknowledge um, Michael, you can unmute and you are allowed to speak. Hi guys, I'm uh, Michael Lipinski, 167 Shootsbury Road in Amherst. I'm a member of Smart Solar Amherst and I'm very interested in the issues that your working group will be discussing as you craft the solar bylaw for the town of Amherst. I found uh, Chris's presentation in particular to be absolutely fascinating and very well done. I'm a member of Smart Solar Amherst because about a year ago, my wife and I were notified that although we live in an area that's solidly zoned as outlying residential, we were now facing a shocking proposal from Amp Energy and the Coles Land Company. This partnership wanted to construct a 45 acre industrial solar facility in our backyard and the backyards of over 20 additional homes along Shinsbury Road. This industrial solar facility would have completely destroyed an existing mature forest ecosystem, and it would have threatened the public health, safety, and welfare of the residents of our residential neighborhood. It also had the potential to negatively impact the overall natural environment and watershed in our town of Amherst. Well, thankfully, this ill-conceived and poorly planned proposal was rather abruptly withdrawn by the applicants, but there's no guarantee that this kind of proposal may be resubmitted. I know your group has a lot on its plate, but learning a little bit about this withdrawn proposal will help you understand why your job is so important. I would urge you to stay focused on the job at hand, which is creating a solar bylaw and to avoid going down the rabbit hole of state energy goals, solar capacity, how much energy the town of Amherst chooses, or how many solar panels the town needs. These are much broader energy policy issues. They are not zoning bylaw issues. We have enough work to do, and I really would encourage the group to stay focused on the job at hand. And by the way, thank you guys for doing this. It's a lot of work. And I hope to be attending every member, uh, every meeting I can to uh, assist in any way possible. Thank you. All right, thank you, Michael. Kathleen Bridgewater, you may unmute. Hello, um, I, my name is Kathleen Bridgewater. I also live at 167 Shootsbury Road. I didn't know my husband was going to make a comment. Uh, but uh, I would say bravo for what he said. 
And I do want to thank everyone on this committee for volunteering. I know it takes a lot of time and a lot of focus um, and a lot of cooperation among you. The staff are, are tremendous in the way they've already been built up what is going to be happening in this committee. Thank you so much for your, for your issues. And thank you uh, for seeing that there are multiple issues that funnel into the decisions that you make and the, and the points that you make in such a law. Thank you so much. Bye-bye. Thank you. If anyone else would like to make a comment, please electronically yeah, raise your hand. A, oh. a real life person, oh. yes. Yeah. Um, can, <laughs> you, Renee, lost. Renee, I'm sorry. Can you please oh, sit okay. at the table and use the microphone because otherwise people on Zoom can't hear you. Could you spell your last name please for the minutes? I live at 277 Shrewsbury Road. Um, I, I don't really have much to say. You know, I, I support what Mike and Kathleen say, and I'm, I'm very grateful for the work that you've all agreed to do to, for, for this. Um, as, and as you were talking about looking at um, bylaws from other towns, I think that's extremely important. And, and when we look at the, the, the land court cases, we look at the um, Supreme Judicial Court cases, I also hope you will look at the cases right here in Hampshire and Franklin County that have failed miserably in Williamsburg and in Conway so that this committee and all of us can learn through these, from this and not make these same mistakes. Um, you know, uh, I, I guess basically that's what I have to say. And once again, thank you for, for your work. Thank you. Okay, um, last call for public comment. Great, thank you. Um, any last comments from the working group or otherwise I'll make, well, I guess I, we need a motion to it. Do we need a motion to adjourn? We need a motion to adjourn. Would anybody like to make a motion to adjourn? So moved, I'm not sure if I can make the motion. I'll, I'll second. Great, okay. Um, can we just go all fa all in favor, or do we need a voice vote? I guess we can do a voice vote. McGowan, yes. Gregor, yes. Tanner, yes. Brooks, yes. All right. The meeting is adjourned. All right. Meeting is adjourned. Thank you. <laughs>